So um, we're going to be um, starting the chordates and specifically the vertebrates. And then we're going to, after this is over, we're going to start talking about the individual systems. And we'll be uh, focusing primarily on human systems. So we'll first start talking about the human digestive system. But first, we're going to talk about the different types of chordates that we have. So if you look at this image that I gave you, this shows the evolutionary relationships between the major animal phyla. And so which invertebrate are we most closely related to based upon this cladogram? Starfish, right? So you might want to you want to might want to circle that as being kind of weird, right? So if we go back and we look at what separates the chordates and the echinoderms, us and starfish from the other invertebrates, it has to do with embryonic development. So protostome and deuterostome development. So there's this idea that is backed up with DNA data, molecular data, that suggests that development doesn't change very often, and when it does, it's a big significant event. So we're gonna talk about what deuterostome and protostome development mean, so that you can understand why we are more closely related to echinoderms. Another echinoderm that um, is uh, oftentimes used in the study of development are sea urchins. So we even use, uh, scientists use sea urchins to even study our early embryonic development because it's very similar to how we undergo development. But it's a lot easier to look at because they have external fertilization and they develop outside of um, the individual in just sea water, okay? So the first thing we're gonna talk about are differences in embryonic development. So when you have sexual reproduction, remember that we have an egg, right? And then we have the sperm. So this is my egg and sperm. And they come together to form a single cell, which is called the zygote. And I'm drawing the nucleus in there. So this is my zygote. So this is a fertilized egg. So all animals, um, most animals, the vast majority of animals use sexual reproduction. So we all start out as a single cell. So this is the same in almost all animals. You start out with a zygote. And then the zygote starts to undergo cell division and it produces a solid ball of cells. And it's surrounded by a membrane. Okay, so that type of cell division is asexual because the cells are just copying their genetic material and then dividing. So this is a solid ball of cells. And it has a name and it is called a morula. So something interesting happens in that the cells start to migrate to the outside and notice how they're getting smaller because they're having the cell, the cytoplasm of the cell each time they divide. And I'm drawing this so that it's two dimensional, but you wanna think of it more like a water balloon. So a water balloon is three dimensional and the inside is hollow. So this is a hollow ball of cells or maybe a hollow sphere. Right. And the, the inside is filled with fluid. At this point in the majority of animals, the, this embryo is going to break free from that membrane and it actually starts to swim around. So even in us, in early embryonic development, we have this, oh, sorry, this is called a blastula. We have this blastula with cilia on it that's swimming around in the female's reproductive tract. And it is gonna get ready to implant, which means that it actually releases digestive enzymes and it digests its way into the lining of the uterus. So this is what in us implants. And like sea stars and sea urchins, it's just kind of swimming around in the water. Okay. So it is the mobile larvae still called a blastula. And then something interesting happens. 
in that one part of the blastula starts to invaginate. And so it kind of creates an opening to the inside. Okay, so this, that invagination, so if I were to just draw this with a line, it might look something like this. The cells were too tiny to see. That is the opening to the digestive system. And it is going to eventually go, if we're talking about um, an organism with a complete digestive tract, like say, for example, earthworms or, um, or uh, insects, or us, it's going to eventually form, and it's gonna keep going, and it's gonna form two openings, okay? So this is called a gastrula. So think digestive system is your gastrovascular tract. So gastrovascular means stomach. Gastro means stomach. A gastroenterologist studies your stomach and your digestive tract, okay? So gastrula, so this is the first opening. And so this is, the, in some organisms, this is the mouth, okay? So this is where the difference comes in. So we have protostomes. Prostome. Stome, if you took, um, if you took biology 102, you might have learned about stomata. Does anybody remember what stomata are? On leaves, you have little openings, little holes, right? So stoma means mouth, means an opening, right? So protostomes means that the first opening becomes the mouth. Okay, so this would be in annelids, nematodes, round worms, segmented worms, in arthropods, and in mollusks. You know, I would much rather be closely related to an octopus. I think octopus are a lot cooler than sea stars, right? And they have big brains and they have this, you know, complex behavior, but that's not true based upon molecular data and also developmental data, okay? So the other name is deutero, and deutero means other. So this means that the first opening becomes the anus. And the second opening becomes the mouth. So it's like there has been a flip of the digestive tract and the way that it develops. And so this is um, believed to be a really significant evolutionary event, which is the reason why chordates and echinoderms are always placed close on your cladogram. So this would be chordata and echinoderms. Now, there are other little differences between the development of protostomes and deuterostomes, but this is what they're named after, the development. The cells divide a little bit different um, around the different axes, and um, the three embryonic tissue layers develop a little bit different. But this is primarily um, the difference between protostomes and deuterostomes. So if you look up at back at your diagram, you'll notice that that is shown, right? Right here, deuterostome development and protostome development. Okay. So notice that you have to have a complete digestive system in order for this to be relative, right? Or important. So if you look at the jellyfish and the sponges and the planaria, they do not have complete digestive tracts, and so that's why they branch off sooner than um, the protostomes and the deuterostomes. Okay. So if you turn your piece of paper over, this is actually a cladogram that shows the evolution of chordates um, but it shows the echinoderms of what, as what they call the outgroup. 
So this is what we would call the out group. Okay. So it is not a chordate, but it is closely related or more closely related to the chordates because it is an ancestral deuterostome. So what this means is all of these organisms are deuterostomes. And we can see as we branch off the different characteristics that um, are present. So notice that the notochord is one of those characteristics that it has to be present in all chordates. So it is very ancestral, right? So you might want to put ancestral next to that. So the chordates, unfortunately, they give them the, um, the uh, more scientific name. I couldn't find a, a better image than this. So these are invertebrates. Right? So that would be the lancelet is on top, and then that's the sea squirt on the bottom. And then we get the evolution of the cranium. So notice here, this shows that all of us, after this um, happens, all of the court, rest of the chordates have a cranium. So that's why there's this bar. Okay, so this is showing you that all of them from the point of that particular spot, all of the rest have a skull, okay? So that's what that means. The craniates mean a skull, okay? So this is my hagfish. It does not have vertebrae, so hence the vertebrae bar does not go up that far. But then the first fish to have a vertebrae is actually what are referred to as lamprey. So this is my lamprey. And that's the group that we're gonna talk about next. So these are the jawless fish. Now, um, we have lamprey in the Umatilla River and the Columbia River, and they are native. So they are called the Pacific lamprey. And the Pacific lamprey are said to be anadromous. So in lab today, I have an example of a lamprey that was taken from the Umatilla River and they froze it. So we're gonna thaw it out and look at it. And anadromous means that it has a lifestyle that where it starts in fresh water, it migrates out into the ocean where it gets big and becomes an adult, and then it comes back into the rivers to um, spawn. So there's um, larvae are in the fresh water. And they are filter feeders. So they burrow down into the sand and I have some uh, preserved um, uh, larvae of the lamprey that you can look at in lab as well. So they are filter feeders, and then they stay in the in the freshwater for years, like maybe four years, and then they migrate out to the ocean. And this is the adult. Now the ocean has a lot more nutrients; it's much, much more nutrient rich in our freshwater ecosystems. And so this is where they can get big, right? And they do this in an unusual way. And so they are actually ectoparasites on other fish, right? So they might attach onto a large um, salmon they might attach, attach onto tuna, right? So they might attach on and feed off of the larger fish. And so, and then they drop off. So then they come back to the fresh water to spawn. So they migrate up and they use smell to do this, right? And this is where they spawn. So this is where they release egg and sperm, right? And then they die.
Now, this is significant for a couple of reasons. This actually brings nutrients that are in the ocean back into a freshwater ecosystem, which is like this huge input of nutrients, right? When they die, that adds all kinds of nutrients to the water. And this is significant because it's going to help to feed, right? It's going to kind of be the basis of the food chain, and it's going to help to feed their offspring ultimately, because it's going to make the freshwater much more nutrient rich, right? And then the larvae, you know, that form become filter feeders, and then the cycle continues. So obviously this is very similar to the salmon or many salmon life cycles, right? But salmon are a jawed fish, right? And they're not ectoparasites. And um, sometimes these organisms are called eels, but eel is not the correct scientific terminology for them because eels are bony fish with jaws. So they're not eels. So they'll talk about, sometimes you hear native people talking about the eels in the, in the, in the, in the river, but that's actually, they're talking about the lamprey. Now, in some places, they have actually become invasive and you're having to deal with uh, eliminating them. So these are native, right? So we're spending a lot of money and the tribes are spending a lot of money trying to um, figure out how to keep them um, alive in the rivers, specifically because the dams prevent them from migrating it properly, right? So the, the dams are hindrance. In fact, you can actually sometimes go to McNary Dam and go to the fish ladder, and these are the creatures that are sucked up on the window. And you can see they have these suction cup mouths, and they have these rasping teeth, but no jaws. Okay? So you can sometimes see them at the fish ladders. So we also have Atlantic lamprey. And because of the way that we have opened up the Great Lakes to uh, boats that are coming in from the ocean, we have actually created a way for the Atlantic lamprey to invade the Great Lakes. So they are an invasive, 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 that's not how you spell that. Invasive species in the Great Lakes. Like, so we have bass, for example, in the Great Lakes. And so they have caused a rapid decline of other fish species. And so when you hear about lamprey being pests, that's the ones you're, you're, you're talking about because our lamprey are actually good. They're not invasive and they're native and they kind of play an important role in the ecosystem. Okay, so they're trying to eliminate the Atlantic lamprey in the Great Lakes. Okay, so if we look at these organisms, this is just an example of uh, the lamprey feeding upon their host, so their parasites but it's on the outside, so it's considered to be an ecto rather than an endoparasite. Okay, so moving along, we're gonna talk about the jawed fish. And so the first jawed fish that we see are the cartilaginous fish. So these include sharks, skates, rays, and something called a rat fish. <coughs> the interesting thing about this is they're called cartilaginous because their skeleton is composed of cartilage only. So they don't have a bony skeleton. So there's no bones, right? So no bones. This interestingly is a derived trait because the ancestor had bones. So the question is, how did they evolve to just have cartilage instead of bones? Well, if you look at the way we develop, we start out, our skeleton starts out as a type of cartilage called hyaline cartilage. 
so that when we're little fetuses, we are actually composed of cartilage, not bones. And then the cartilage starts to ossify and become mineralized and calcium and phosphate are put in as salts into our bones. And so this is actually an example of pedomorphosis. So this means that it is a retention of a juvenile trait. So for some reason, they evolved to retain their embryonic cartilaginous skeleton rather than having bones. Now, there was a group of fish that preceded the cartilaginous fish, so they were not the first uh, bony fish. The first bony fish, and you don't need to know this, but it's kind of, they're kind of impressive, are what are referred to, oops, are referred to as the placoderms. And so this could have been, this was the first fish that evolved before the cartilaginous fish. So these are the placoderms. And this means that they have plated skin. That typically placoderm. Right? And so they actually had these bones that covered their head. The rest of their body was not, didn't have this um, bony covering. But you can notice that they even have plates, bony plates around their eyes. So these are extinct, but they're observed in the fossil record. And if you look at the size of this head, just the jaw alone is half a meter, right? So the jaws were like this big. So these were like big predators in the, in the primitive oceans. So these preceded the cartilaginous fish. So the other thing that we need to talk about is where the jaws come from, because all of a sudden we have jaws where before we didn't. So in the fossil record, all of a sudden you see animals with jaws, fish with jaws. So they're the first group that evolved jaws. And if you look at here, the jaws evolved from modified gill arches, or sometimes these are called supports. So remember that all chordates have pharyngeal gills, but in order to support those openings, you have to have a skeletal element to support them. So this would be like in the lamprey. So notice in the lamprey, they do not have jaws, but they have these skeletal elements that are served, that serve as support. So here we see that these have been modified to form the jaw. And so I have a, a shark jaw that you'll be able to look at in lab. And you'll see that it is composed of cartilage. And it is very different from our jaw. It's super simple. But the other thing that they have that's really cool is, is they have multiple rows of teeth. And once one set of teeth kind of starts to wear out, they just lose those. And the next row just kind of comes on board. So even in a shark jaw, they'll have multiple rows of teeth already forming in that cartilaginous um, skeleton. So even their jaws are cartilaginous. Their teeth, however, are hard and brittle. So their teeth have mineralization like ours do. They would have enamel. So this is a shark. This is what they call a ratfish. So it's very similar to, or it's in the same group as the sharks and the skates and the rays. So one thing that these organisms do not have, which is significant, is, is that they lack a swim bladder. So what this means is, is that when, if they stop swimming, they will sink to the bottom of the ocean. So there's no buoyancy. So if they stop swimming, they sink. So some sharks, for example, mate 
And when they mate, the male uses a modified fin to fertilize the female to put his sperm. And so they start at the top of the water column and then they're mating and then they just kind of fall down because they're not able to swim. And then they come to the bottom of the ocean and then they come apart, right? Because they will simply fall. And this is really significant because that swim bladder is actually going to become the lung. Okay, so the next group are is the osteichthys. And so if you look at that first part of the word, think about osteoarthritis, right? Osteo means bone. And so these are the bony fish. So we have bony fish. So ichthys means fish. So somebody that studies fish, or if you were gonna go on and take an upper division uh, class just on fish, it is called ichthyology. So this is the study of fish. Right, so you could be a, a professional, that, professional ichthyologist. This by far is the most abundant group of fish, right? So when we think about fish, we're generally thinking about the bony fish. So this includes like salmon and sturgeon is important to realize that I did not list sturgeon under the cartilaginous fish. I listed it under the bony fish. So sturgeon have more cartilage than normal, but they still have bones and they can get really huge like in the Snake River. And then we have things like tuna, right, really important, huge fish. And then halibut. Has anybody ever seen a halibut, like at the aquarium? What's unique about them? They're massive and they're flat, right? So their eyes are up on top, so they, they're flat fish. Their halibuts are really amazing. Okay, and then we have things like trout and eels. Right? And then think about all the fish that you see on the coral reef, right? Those are bony fish, including the, um, including the seahorse and the pipefish. So seahorse and pipefish are really weird looking fish, but they are still bony fish. So we have different groups of osteichthys. And so um, when we're talking about bony fish, most of the time we're talking about ray finned fish. And what this means is, is they, they, they don't have bones, real like, like bones like we have out in their fins, right? So they have no bones in, in their fins. Now this is different from what we call the lobe fin fish. So the lobe fin fish, there's very few of these. They're down in the bottom of the ocean and they, um, use their, their fins to kind of move around. So the lobe fin fish have bones out into their fins. So they kind of uh, move around on the bottom of the ocean. Now I forgot to mention when the walking catfish So if you've ever lived down south, one of the really interesting that, things that happens down south is, is that they have catfish that when it rains and like when it really rains, like when it like the sky opens up and it's like pouring rain, the rivers kind of turn, or the, excuse me, the streets kind of turn into rivers and all the creeks flood. And then you might see fish walking down the street, right? Or they might walk across your yard. And those are walking catfish. And what they're doing is they're just migrating from one stream to another. So they're kind of taking advantage of the torrential downfall 
to kind of disperse in, in their environment. But those are not low fin fish. They still have ray fin fish that they can move around. And all you have to do is Google walking catfish, and there's people that have had tons of YouTube videos about fish walking across their patios and that kind of stuff. So the other group of fish that we have, so this is one, two, three. We have the lungfish. And these are not very diverse either. They're found generally in Australia and Africa and in South America. So they're not native to our part of the world. So. There's lots of, of lungfish in Australia, Africa, South America. So we do not have lungfish here. The significance of the lungfish is, is that they can breathe air for extended periods of time. So they can... Um, completely dry out. So the catfish still have gills and they're kind of using the air, but they would dry out really fast if they don't find a stream to, to kind of go into. So the lungfish can dry out, right? So this prevents death during dehydration. I forgot to cue my lungfish video. Let's see if I can find it really quick. Lungfish video. Southern Africa is home to a very primitive fish with some extraordinary abilities. It's the lungfish, and while it has gills like any other fish, it can also breathe air directly using a modified swim bladder that acts as a lung. When water levels are high, this isn't so important, but the rains will eventually fail, and the constant burning sun will dry up all the water. Fish are left flapping at the surface as the waters disappear. Only the air gulping lungfish is able to cope with these extreme conditions, but it's still exposed to the heat and it's still at risk from predators. So it relies on another, even more extraordinary ability. It finds a new, safer home buried underground. Digging down by eating mud and pushing it out through its gills. To stop it drying out, the lungfish exudes a special mucus from its skin, covering itself in a thick layer that hardens to form a waterproof cocoon. Only a single hole is left for breathing. Baked into this mud sarcophagus, the lungfish slows its metabolism to 1 60th of its original rate, relying on its muscles and body fat as a source of food and water. It becomes just another piece of hardened mud and lungfish have even been known to end up as an accidental brick in a mud hut wall. But this isn't the end for the lungfish. It can survive like this for an incredible four years. Eventually, it could end up poisoned by its own waste products. But in this case, the onset of the rains is its salvation. As the mud walls are washed away, the lungfish's hard mucus lining is softened. It's been four years since it last used its muscles, and they're very weak. But as it breaks free of this mud cocoon, it still manages to drag itself towards the nearest source of water. It's the ultimate survivor. And although it's underwater now, it'll soon be back in the mud, repeating the whole process again and again as the annual rains come and go. Okay. Okay, so they mentioned what is the lung that they use? What is their lung? 
their swim bladder, right? So all bony fish have a swim bladder. So we're going to do a dissection of a perch in lab today, and you'll be able to see the swim bladder. So the swim bladder is actually, um, when we look at it from evolution, it is an out pocket of the pharynx. And I think I talked about how the pharynx in chordates is like the back of your throat. So it is the common opening to your respiratory and your digestive systems. And so that makes sense because if it's an out pocket of the pharynx, you could see how we could then evolve the trachea and then the lungs that branch off of the trachea. So um, the lung fish have a modified swim bladder, okay? Lung fish have a modified swim bladder. that allows them to breathe air. But what do you think the swim bladder is generally used for in the other bony fish? We mentioned it with, what do the sharks have a problem with? What are they unable to do? Buoyancy, right? So they have to, they just sink to the bottom. So it's kind of like putting a life vest on, right? You fill your, your swim bladder with air and you move up in the water column. You absorb air out of your swim bladder and you can go down. And so you see these fish that are like in the middle of the water column and they're sleeping, right? And they're not moving and they do not sink. And so this provides buoyancy. So it keeps them from sinking. They do not have to swim all the time to keep from going to the bottom of the ocean. So that's a big advantage. So this is actually a, an image of a, um, of a uh, low finned fish. So you can see that this is probably something you might not see. It's called a coelacanth. Okay. And so their uh, fins, this fin would have like a humerus and a radius in it. So there's actually arm bones out into the fins for the beginning of arm bones. Okay, so this takes us to the next group of uh, chordates, which are called the tetrapods. We are tetrapod. So what do you think that means? Four limbed. So we are tetrapods, as are reptiles, birds, amphibians, right? We are four-limbed. So when we look at the tetrapods, we could ask, what did they evolve from? Which ones did they evolve from? And so it's believed that the um, they evolved from the lobe finned or bony finned ancestor. So evolved from a bony fish ancestor. So when we look in the fossil record, one of the things that scientists are looking for are what are called transitional fossils. So these might have been organisms that were around a long time ago and are now extinct, but they also might have had a transition or show kind of an intermediate between a bony fish and a tetrapod. And so there is an example of a tra transitional fossil, which is called tiktalic. Okay, so tiktalic um, is the transitional fossil between fish and amphibians. So I'm going to play a video now that talks about these transitions 
and looking for transitional fossils and spe specifically the characteristics of tiktaalik that kind of um, give us an idea of how tetrapods could have evolved. Our planet is teeming with many kinds of animal life, including groups with defining structures, such as the four legs of land animals, the feathered wings of birds, and the dexterous hands of primates. Understanding the origins of these structures and of the groups that possess them has long been a central quest of biology. Charles Darwin asserted that each kind of animal must have evolved from pre-existing earlier kinds of animals that lacked those structures. He boldly predicted that buried in the crust of the earth were animals that connected one major group to another. Such transitional fossils would be intermediate in form between earlier and later groups. What made Darwin's prediction so bold was at the time he stated in The Origin of Species, no such fossils had been found. His critics immediately latched on to the admission that transitional animals are somehow missing from the fossil record. Over the decades, it's become a standard talking point for those who have closed their mind to the science of evolution. There you go. Yeah, that's the stuff. But in fact, since Darwin, paleontologists have unearthed hundreds of transitional creatures that have enabled us to reconstruct the origins of many groups. And even so, searching for such fossils remains a challenging adventure, and finding the right one can change the way we think about the origins of living creatures. For me, paleontology has always been about filling the gaps in the story of life. And for a long time, one of the biggest ones was understanding the origin of animal limbs with fingers and toes. Paired limbs are a feature of many animals, but there's little at first glance that suggests the limbs of different species are related. On frogs, they're springy. On elephants, not so much. They're feathered on eagles, not on bats. But inside the limbs of mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and birds, one finds a common architecture. Here's a dog. Dogs run and jump. What do you have? One bone, two bones, little bones, and then the digits, the equivalents of the fingers and toes. And, of course, here's a bird. It flies. Its limb has been modified into a wing, and it has one bone, Two bones, lots of bones, and then digits. The amazing fact is every four-limbed animal walking the earth today has this fundamental pattern. One bone, two bones, little bones, fingers. That pattern suggests a connection between these very different groups of animals. And it's not the only feature they share. They also all have a backbone. They're vertebrates. The history of vertebrates has been captured in rock we can accurately date. Fossils reveal when each of these groups of animals first emerged. The youngest group is the birds. Go further back in time and you'll find the first mammals, and then the first reptiles, and the first amphibians. And then you get to 370 million years ago. Suddenly, there are no four-limbed creatures or tetrapods anywhere to be found. Where the first tetrapods came from has always been one of the great mysteries of biology. I mean, it's not like there weren't animals, vertebrates, around 400 million years ago. There were, but they were all fish. Did four-legged animals come from fish? Fish might seem unlikely candidates to be the earliest ancestors of frogs, horses, and humans. They don't even have limbs. They have fins. Despite 
despite their different external appearances, there are revealing similarities. First, fish and tetrapods are vertebrates. And early in life, when they are embryos, they look remarkably similar. Finally, DNA analysis shows that fish are tetrapods' closest relatives. All of this suggests four-legged animals did indeed come from fish. But how did a fish with fins give rise to tetrapods with four legs? As a young scientist, I wanted to find fossils that could help answer that question. I knew it wasn't going to be easy. The world's a big place. The Earth is a giant planet. And fossils are very small, so how do you find those things? Well, there's a checklist we run through. We look for places in the world that are rocks of the right age. You know, if you're interested in the origin of dinosaurs, there's one age of rock to look at. If you're interested in the origin of land living creatures, there's another age of rocks. Then you look for places in the world that have rocks of the right type, the kinds of rocks that are likely to hold fossils. A lot of things have to come together for an animal to be fossilized. For starters, it has to be in the right kind of setting where sediments form. And soon after it dies, it has to be buried, before its remains are ravaged by decay, weather, or scavengers. The dirt and mud burying it has to harden sufficiently to protect what's left for thousands or more likely millions of years. After which, something, say erosion, has to bring the embedded remains to the surface. And then, someone who cares about such things, like me or my longtime colleague Ted Dashler, has to wander by and find it. The fossils I wanted to find would have been alive in the Devonian era, between 365 and 385 million years ago. But where could we find the right kinds of rocks from that era? But you can still see them in the I remember sitting in the office. And we were doing this sort of usual banter one day about something geological. We had a college textbook, and just thumbing through the, the diagrams in the book, and boom, there was this figure that changed our lives. I remember seeing that and saying to myself, holy cow, this is what we're looking for. It was a map of North America, which highlighted three areas of Devonian rock of just the right type to hold fossil fish moving onto land. Two of those areas had already been worked on, so we focused on the third, the Canadian Arctic. My heart was racing when I saw that, because and I'm sure yours was too. I mean, no paleontologists had worked on that, expressly looking for early tetrapods. Then you dug out the, uh, the aerial photos, and that's when I got kind of terrified. <laughs> I remember seeing this for the first time, thinking, you got to be kidding me. Now look at all this snow. How do you work there? The Arctic presents some unusual challenges. You're far from help, so you have to bring everything you'll need. And you have to move fast because the season is short. And you don't want to be there when the weather turns. So when the helicopter drops you off the Arctic for the first time, <laughs> you're standing here saying, what am I doing here? You know, you're thinking about polar bears. That's the first thing you look for. Is there anything on landscape? Everything white becomes a polar bear when you're first here. The last thing on your mind are fossils. It's hard to believe when you look out across this frozen terrain that once this was a warm, watery world swimming with life. There's this huge distance between the present and the past. What we see today is a valley with red and green rocks that are tilted and stacked one on top of the other. But that's not how it was in the past. These valleys have been carved by glaciers that have moved back and forth. And those red and green rocks actually at one point extended across the valley. And they were straight, they weren't tilted. Now look inside the rocks and what those rocks tell us that this valley 375 million years ago was a giant floodplain. And that floodplain was filled with rivers that swallowed their banks and sometimes shrunk, but in those conditions formed swamps and streams of all different sizes. And inside those streams was diverse life. Including, we suspected, a fish with features that would ultimately enable animals to walk on land. But 
even if it had been there, could we find evidence of it buried on one of the nameless hillsides that had built up and eroded over the past 375 million years? So how do you find fossils? I pick up a lot of stuff, right? Sometimes it's just a piece of rock. <laughs> Sometimes it's bird poop. Sometimes it's a leaf. Uh, but occasionally, you know, it's a jaw with teeth in it. So what you begin to learn is to tell the difference between white, which is not bone, and white, which is bone, teeth, or scale. Once you have that in your mind, then you start to apply that search image to other rocks. Here's another scale here that stands out like a sore thumb. And then we go, you look around, right, right here. Okay, so this is the underside of a, of a small. So you never know where you're gonna hit it around here. You know, that's why we keep on looking. But that first expedition ended without finding what we had come for. And as our second trip drew to a close, we were still searching. Then, a bit before our scheduled departure, we had a real scare. The team had separated. The idea is everybody needs to return back to camp by radio call. Hey, I see Jason. No, I see Jason. You see Jason. I see you the question. You see Jason. And all of a sudden, it became, where's Jason? This is our youngest member. We were looking out for him the entire season, and no Jason. I mean, my heart was really beginning to race. I hear footsteps outside the tent. There's Jason. His eyes are like globes, and it's like I found him. I mean, there, every pocket was burgeoning with bones. Was right, like these bones. He's laying them out on the table one after another. It's daylight, 24 hours a day. So we ran down to Jason's site. As soon as we came to this bluff here and looked down. We saw why Jason was so excited. Because beneath our feet were fossil fish bones, fragments of fossil fish, many of them, thousands of them. It wasn't just one fish, it was a whole aquarium. It was a different species. It got better. Because as we walked up the hill and we followed that carpet of fossil fragments, it stopped, meaning it likely came from one layer. And if we had any luck at all, we'd find that layer and see what's inside. Hard as we tried, we couldn't discover what was buried in Jason's hill before we had to leave. But we kept coming back to it in following years to dig, chip, and search. The second week of July in 2004, we're all working in series in this hole. You know, where my head is right next to Farish's feet, and Farish's feet is next to Steve Gates. You know, we're digging together. Steve says, Hey guys, what's this? Ted and I go running over to see what Steve was referring to, and what we saw was this V here, it was covered with rock. And as soon as we saw this V, and we saw these teeth under it, it became very clear that this little V we're seeing is the tip of a snout, and that this was the snout of a flat-headed fish. And it was sticking out of the rock, so if we had any luck whatsoever, the rest of the creature would be encased in the rock. And here it is. What's really wonderful about this specimen is that we have pretty much the whole thing. And the whole thing is put together. That is, the head is connected to the body. And the body is connected to the fins. So we know that this fin comes from this body. And when we put it all together, we see this creature is about four feet long. And some of the biggest were about nine feet long. What's really amazing is that this is an animal that Darwin would have predicted. A real mix of characteristics combination of fish-like and tetrapod-like features. Like a fish, it has scales on its back, and it also has fins with, with thin rays. But like a tetrapod, it has a flat head with eyes on top. And when we look inside the body, we see these huge interlocking ribs that suggested that it had lungs. When you put the body and the head together, you see it had a neck where the head could move independently of the body. That means this animal could use the neck to peer outside the water, find prey, and avoid predators. So we have many bones of these animals, including this one, which is a hip bone of these creatures. And what it reveals is that the hind fins were already evolving into legs while these animals were living in water. I get really excited when I see the front fins of TikTok. Here's one from one of the larger specimens. 
And what you see is the shoulder, but also some of the fin bones inside. What you see is a version of the one bone, two bone pattern that's inside our own arms. You have one bone, two bones, even have a version of a wrist. And once those fins were strong enough to lift its body out of the water, a whole new frontier opened. Over millions of years, the two pairs of fins in fish like Tiktaalik would lead to the two pairs of limbs in every tetrapod. So what does this all mean? What it means is that our arms and legs are derived from the paired fins of our fishy ancestors. So how fast did this transition happen? Well, we know that Tiktaalik didn't exist in a vacuum. There are other creatures, other transitional fossils that are more fish-like and others that are more tetrapod-like. And these creatures existed for over 15 million years. So what this means is that this great transition from fish to tetrapod didn't happen in a single step, but happened gradually over time. The discovery of Tiktaalik made headlines because it is one of the earliest in a series of fossils that illuminate the transition from water to land. And that's just one key transition that fossils have shed light on. One of the very first was the evolution of birds from feathered dinosaurs. That's now one of the best documented transitions in the story of life. Oh, this is cool. What it and other well-studied examples tell us is that what at first seemed to be huge leaps are almost always products of a series of smaller evolutionary steps. That's true for when our fish ancestors first came to land, when dinosaurs took to the air, and when we first stood upright. Oops. Okay, are there any questions? So that's just one example of a transitional fossil that we'll talk about. We'll talk about some more when we talk about the evolution of reptiles and birds as well. So that is it for today. And I will see you hopefully in lab in just a few minutes.